Amen. Happy Sabbath. Good morning. Welcome. Uh, we're so glad that you have joined us here for uh, GCA Alumni Weekend 2024. My name is Serge Garapi. I'm the principal here at GCA. This is my, my second year as principal, but my 16th year here at GCA. And uh, just so happy to be able to worship with you and celebrate this homecoming uh, for all of us this weekend. Uh, just a, a few announcements that I'd like to run through here, and then we would, we'll launch right into the program. Um, first of all, GCA staff are here and around campus. Uh, you'll see us with the silver name badges, and so if you see one of us and you have a question, uh, please stop us. Uh, maybe tell us when you were here or uh, show us your name badge, and we'll, we'll, uh, we'll talk, and then we, we can answer some questions about the campus and um, what you might need from us. Um, some of you have not been back to the campus since uh, we've had a, just a couple of new facilities added. Uh, you're in one of them now. Hopefully, hopefully this is, if this is your first time here, a uh, special welcome. Uh, we, we've been so proud to, to use this new space uh, ever since the 2019 year. And uh, we're just, uh, again, want to invite you to roam the campus. If you have not seen some of our facilities, we're going to have the Student Center uh, upper campus open for you guys to walk through and, and get to know and kind of see the new additions of our, of our, of our space. Um, in the program, we do have a campus map uh, in there, so if you, that will help you maybe find your way around this campus. Five years ago, the uh, class of 1969 gifted the school with a touchscreen monitor that's out in the lobby here of the gym right now, uh, loaded with lots of photos, uh, yearbooks, historic information, and more. A lot of our current students enjoy finding that, uh, that screen and, and looking through um, your books, but you might want to go through it and find your year, your pictures there on that ton screen. So please take some time and enjoy interacting with that. Um, and thank you again to the class of 1969 for the gift. Many of you uh, have not in, uh, had a cafeteria meal in, in, a, in a while, and we would like to in invite you to join us for Sabbath lunch today. Uh, following the worship service. Our food staff have prepare, prepared enough uh, delicious food for everyone, so just please uh, enjoy fellowship, enjoy the food, come join us. If you, when we exit this place here after the church is over, we'll go through the lobby and into the left, uh, into the cafeteria, you'll see the serving lines are in there. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll get the food there. You can, if there's seats in the cafeteria still, join us inside. There's also a lot of tables back here behind the black curtain. Uh, you can join and, and sit in there as well. And if you're looking for any vegan or gluten-free options, when you walk right into the cafeteria to the right, there is a round table there that will have some options for you if, if that's your preference. So again, please join us for lunch. We're, uh, we're looking forward to having you here for the, for the afternoon. So if you join us for lunch, you'll be here to, to walk around the campus. And then, of course, join us for um, your honor class get-togethers. Um, right after the benediction of this program, we are going to ask the honor classes to stay by for honor class photos. So the rest of everybody can head off to get lunch, but we want the honor classes to go sequentially through here, and we'll announce them as we go. But stay here so we can have a photo taken right after the church service. We're going to start uh, with the most recent years and work our way backwards through the, the years and then um, dismiss to get lunch. So please stay by for that. Um, the offering today, will, uh, we'll, we'll collect an offering here, and it will be uh, used to help our students through the Worthy Student Fund. Um, if you have, I think we're collecting through the church, we'll be collecting cash if you have it. Um, if you would like to give through the GCA website, we have a link, gcasda.org slash give, and we will also have a QR code up on the screen uh, during that time. So again... Um, thank you for your, your generosity, for supporting GCA through the Worthy Student Fund. And finally, something new that we're really excited about and we, we have it in the program for 6.30 this evening is a groundbreaking celebration. If you've been out in the lobby here, you've seen some of the boards on the easels that, uh, that have some illustrations of uh, what we're thinking is going to be uh, the renovations and the expansions of our dormitories. Uh, we're also going to be renovating the music building. We're putting in a new counseling center, and uh, we're just excited to, to, to just be moving forward together uh, as we continue to grow Georgia Carmelin Academy. So we'd, we'd invite you to join us 6.30 this evening. We have some, some great uh, um, 
program plan for you. We, we actually have Gordon Beats, Ed Wright, and Gary Restad here speaking, three conference presidents who have overseen, of course, the conference, but of course, the, this, this academy during different uh, uh, campaign, capital campaign times. And so please join us for that. We're excited to launch um, officially with this new campaign. All right, Mr. President, Mr. Light, let's kind of come and join here. We're going to start with roll call, and uh, we're going to go through the list here. And what I'd like to do first before we start into uh, the roll call of the alumni is, do I have any uh, current GCA seniors here in the room? Raise your hand if you're a GCA senior. All right, you can, you can applause too if you want to. You're getting excited about graduating soon. All right, guys, take notes. Uh, first of all, in about six weeks, Mrs. Gerard will be invite, or, uh, I'm sorry, welcoming you into the alumni of GCA, all right, as the class of 2024. So in 2029, well, of course, hope you come back uh, all the years between if, uh, if you want, but in 2029, we're going to have your first honor year, your first five-year honor class, and so excited about that. But uh, we're going to go through the, uh, the honor year's roll calls, and um, starting with the 2010s, I'd like to see if we have anyone from the class of 2019 here, the five-year class. If you're part of the five-year honor class, please stand if you're part of 2019. We've got a group in the back, we've got a few over here on the side, and over here on the front. So, well represented, guys. Thank you for being here, 2019. And then going to the 10-year class, 10-year class if you're part of the 2014 class. Have, uh, ha please stand wherever you might be, 2014. All right, we got a good group back there and a few over here in the front. All right, Lewis. All right, the decade of the 2000s. Anybody from the class of 2009, please stand. All right, All right. wonderful. And the class of 2004, please stand. Anybody? Oh, Number here we four. go. We All few. right. I'll just throw out there real quick. The 2009 class, they were seniors my first year here at GCA. So welcome back, you guys. And I think the 2004 class were here when I was student teaching. So I got a good connection with both those classes. All right, going back into the 90s. Uh, do we have anybody here from the class of 1999? Me. 99, Clint, we got a few back there. All right, very good, 25 years. All right, going back to the class of 1994. Please stand if you're a part of the class of 1994. Wow, maybe, raise your hand, anybody, 1994? Okay, let's talk about the 80s. The 80s, the year I was born. Class of 1989, please stand. Anybody? All right. All right. And the class of 1984, please stand. 84. We got a few of those. All right. Continuing on, we have the, the 70s. Um, if you're part of the class of 1979, please stand. Now, the 74 class is, is an important class. This is your 50 year, but we're gonna come back to you in just a minute here, because we're gonna have a, actually a photo um, for the, 19, the 1974 class. But let's go on to the 60s. Class of 1969, please stand. Hey. All right, well, um, how about anybody here who has, oh, and by the way, let me just pause. You know, the first graduating class is the 1965 to 66, and so we're gonna keep uh, adding on, of course, as we go forward, but uh, that, was, that was it there for the 60s. Um, let's talk about anybody else. If you were um, not here for your honor year, but you're here to support a class that was either above you or behind you, and you're here to celebrate with those classes, let's, let's have you guys all stand. In any of the decades here, if you're here, but you're here to support friends in the honor your classes, 
Welcome. So glad you guys are here and joining us. Now, the next thing is, uh, if you are part of a legacy uh, family, so if you have had a, uh, if you're part of a two or three genera generation GCA family, if you or your parents or grandparents or you have a, a child here at GCA or had a child graduate from GCA, if you could please stand. If we have multi-generation families represented here, let's have you guys stand. Awesome, thank you so much. And do we have any former GCA staff members here? If you're a former GCA staff member, if you could stand, or if you're standing in the back, if you could raise your hand. Former GCA staff. All right. Very good. All right, the 50 year honor class. Wow, what an honor. If we could have the 50 year honor class, please come up to the risers here in the front for a group photo. Um, we want to give you guys a, a small gift and a token of our appreciation for you guys. Come on up, give them a round of applause, please. Right here to the front. I know. This is a better idea. Just get my bag. I'm going to get some sauce. Yeah. What a great turnout. I want to give a round of applause to the class of 1974. Thank you so much, you guys. This is a great turnout. 50 years.
while they're, they're going back to the seat, let me just make a quick note here. We, we recognize the, the class of 79 and the class of 09. They had actually special distinction. For, for the longest time, the class of 1979 had the largest class in GCA's history for a long time. Nancy, what was the, what was the number of 79? How many students did they have? Uh, 79 and then 78 in that class, and so they held the record for a long time. And then, I mentioned the class of 2009, they still have the record for the largest class in GCS history. I will say, uh, 09, this year's freshmen might have you, uh, might be uh, coming for that record. This year they had 81 freshmen, the largest freshman class ever. And so we'll see if we can uh, get, uh, you know, add a few more freshmen or a few more of that class over the next few years. So. All right, on a, uh, on, a, on, a, on a more somber note, as, as we acknowledge everyone who is here, uh, I feel like we also need to acknowledge those who are missing, our missing uh, class members and former staff. If you would like to take a moment in your program on pages 30 and 31, you will find deceased class members, classmates, and former staff. We hope that you might take some time after church and go find their memory brick out on center campus. There is a pathway there next to the, next to the fountain area. And you might uh, remember, reminisce, and even when you go to your, your honor class reunions that you might talk about the important role these missing people played in your lives. And, and it is a special attention that we wanna bring uh, to one of our deceased alumnus in particular, Daniel Harper, class of 2004, would be here celebrating his 20 year reunion if he were still living. Daniel lived large in his brief 25 years of life. Some of you may remember receiving a gift book from GCA called Daniel's Blog. This book contains 41 of the 72 blogs Daniel wrote while fighting brain cancer. If you would like a free copy of this book, they will be available after church at the reception desk out in the foyer of the Wellness Center. Please stop by and take a copy. We know you'll be encouraged and inspired by reading Daniel's blog. And now we'd like to do the Life Legacy Awards. Um, this is an award, um, the 25 year and the 40 year class, I had the opportunity to select a staff member or former staff member um, for this award. And uh, this award is um, candidates that impact excuse me, that have an impact on the students and it's the importance of honoring those staff for their role in shaping the young lives of the people here at GCA and, and, and around the area. So um, at this point, I'd like to light, invite um, Scott Begley to come up from the class of 1984 to introduce this award. Uh, Mrs. Kirk or as the class of 84 knew her, we called her mom. And uh, she made a huge impact on everyone that knew her. As someone who, uh, who worked in pastoral ministry and who went through a lot of education and postgrad education, writing papers, I discovered that uh, the lessons that I learned in ninth and 10th grade English classrooms with Mrs. Kirk have stood the test of time and they still affect the way I work today. But more than just English, I think what Mrs. Kirk brought to us was the idea of doing something for someone else just like it had been done for you. She had a famous saying, which my friend Denise reminded me of, that said, count that day lost in which you do not learn something new. And she was always searching and always ready to ask a question and learn from anything she could do, reading, listening, talking. To sum up her legacy, I would say, number one, her legacy was that she taught us all to appreciate Good grammar jokes. Amen. She also taught us that it's okay to cry when you see or you hear something beautiful 
How many times did we see her sitting on that stool in the front of the classroom and reading a poem about somebody waving a flag out a window in New England and she would just have to wipe her eyes? But probably the greatest legacy that Mrs. Kirk has left to us was that she saw the best in everyone, that she would look at some students that were considered hoodlums, She looked at others that were uh, considered, yeah, maybe they're not quite up to academic snuff. And sometimes she went to bat. Sometimes she went to bat for students who had done something that they were absolutely not supposed to and horribly embarrassed other faculty members to the point that they wanted to kick them out of school. So for me is to say that uh, the legacy of Mrs. Kirk is that she made me and everyone that she touched a better person. So in her honor, I would like to present this tribute to her son, remembering who she was and everything that she meant to us. Thank you, Scott. I was fortunate enough to call her mom also. Um, I'd like to thank my wife and my daughter and her husband for being here today. My daughter and her husband drove up, my mother's youngest grandchild, and she will tell you, obviously, her favorite. For those of you who know Rachel, who was her oldest grandchild, don't tell her I said that. Um, Nancy told me I had a minute. She clearly doesn't know me, but I will try to keep my remarks uh, short because there's not enough time in the day to talk about all the wonderful things that my mother did and the person that she was. So I will just keep it brief and say she loved her God, she loved her family, she loved her country, and she loved GCA. She absolutely loved being here She loved all of her students, clearly the class of 84 the best. (laughs) But uh, she was lucky enough that she got to live a life where every day she got to wake up and go to work with something that she was passionate about. And I wish that everyone had that same opportunity to actually get up and be excited about going to work. And she did that every day. So... Everything, Scott said, everything that, you know, that she did in terms of making people better, I consider myself one of the luckiest people alive because I got to grow up with her. So thank you again for doing this. Thank you, GCA, for making her very happy for a number of years. And um, my family is very grateful. The next award will be presented by Clint Higginbotham, the class of 1999, the 25-year class. I will tell you it's a lot different looking at adults than it is kids out in the audience. Uh, Mr. Sterndale was and is so impactful to all of us. He's a lot more than just another faculty. He's a lot more than just a guy who fixes air conditions and buses. He's a lot more than just a bus driver. He is a man who loves what he does. He's a man who cares about every staff and every kid that's been here. But most importantly, he is a man of God, and his influence has touched so many of our lives. 
Let me tell you a quick story about Mr. Sterndale. I don't even know if he knows I'm going to tell this story. So I think it was 19, my junior year, 90, 97, I think it was, September. We went to New England trip, and I remember this clearly. We were driving down some really thin road with a big bus, and I was sitting a row or two behind him, and I said, Mr. Sterndale? He said, yes, Clint, annoyed, because I'm bothering him. Was that our side mirror? Yes, Clint, that was. <laughs> Mr. Sterndale, do we need that? Nah, I'll fix it later. <laughs> That's the cool guy of Mr. Sterndale. He, I mean, I've been on him in gymnastics trips where he, the tire blows and he doesn't get mad. He just fixes it or makes us get out and sit on the side of the road. Um, that's how impactful Mr. Sterndale is, and he, it's, it's all the stuff that he does behind the scenes that, that I'm thankful to hear to be giving him this award. Wow, this is awesome. I mean, you never understand or appreciate how much it is to be said thank you to. You know, the other day I was talking with some of the alumni, and as I was talking to them, one of them asked me, he said, do you remember when so-and-so hit you in the head with a shovel? <laughs> I don't, I'm sorry, I don't remember it. But they sure do. <clears throat> you know, I, it, it, it just overwhelms me. And I appreciate Clint and the class of 1999 for the adoration that you have showed and the appreciation that you have given to me today. This is just accepting praise is something that is very difficult. But God has given it to us to enjoy. You know, when I was here, there's been mention to the fact that I drove a bus. And the steering wheel has been my favorite tool. Because that steering wheel can take me places and I can see things and accomplish things that I can't if I'm just not behind that steering wheel. But while I was behind the steering wheel of that bus is where I met and had relationships with most of you students here at GCA. And it was from those times, those joyful times, those enjoyable, fun times. Yeah, maybe we were sitting alongside the road for a while, but <laughs> we got by it and we got through it. It was fun. You know, the steering wheel that I have chosen in my life has been Jesus Christ. If I hadn't chosen Jesus Christ, I would have never been able to do anything that I have accomplished. All things that we do come from Him. And because I have chosen Jesus Christ, I know that I am going to receive an award and I know that you can receive that award and just as much joy as you have in giving it to me he is going to have in giving it to us to be with him for eternity what is the motto of this weekend I'm going to say I'm going to count to three and then we're going to say it one two three look up Wow. I don't know why they put us up front. Um, there's something to that, I guess. I have a bus story to tell as well. Uh, when we were on our way to our senior class, first 
get together meeting, whatever we called it, retreat. Um, we had a uh, near accident. Our bus driver said there a car pulled out to pass. We were driving over to Camp Cumby Gay. More about that later. Um, if you want to find out, find somebody from 70, uh, 74, they can tell you about that. Anyway, Mountain Roads, Northeast Georgia, car pulls out to pass on a hill. We should have all been dead. Uh, the driver, uh, Mr. Thomas, our bus driver, said that basically the car went through the bus, and when he looked in the rearview mirror, the taillights were going away from us, behind us. Um, he didn't tell us about that at night, but he told us about it later. Um, this group that's sitting here on the front, um, most of us probably wouldn't be here except for the hand of God. Um, we are going to start our worship service with um, a text from Psalm, Psalm 100. Make a joyful shout to the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us, not we ourselves. We are the people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name. For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting and his truth endures to all generations. Let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, we come to you on this Sabbath day, a high day, a day that uh, joy and gladness. We pray that your Holy Spirit will be here with us. Send him here in abundance. Touch each heart. Send us away from here with a blessing. In Jesus' name, amen.
to die Oh, when I come to die It might be the best class, I might be biased, I don't know. But um, after reflecting of 10 years being away from GCA, I would probably say that pancakes don't taste the same without Mr. Bogus making them at our senior gymnastics strip. Disney strips aren't the same without Mr. Torzi making jokes on the bus ride. Uh, now, when I eat banana bread and poppy seed muffins, I can't help but think of our old cafeteria, which students, the cafeteria wasn't here, it was in a building that no longer exists here on campus. Um, learning Spanish in Duolingo is not the same as learning Spanish in Ms. Muriel's class in her fun skits. All of these memories is why I choose to give to GCA. I think we can all agree that this experience on campus was absolutely unforgettable, and it stays in our hearts as we get older. I give because I want others to be able to have experiences like my class did. Ms. Aguirre, I can't say I miss your math classes, but I can say that I believe with my full heart on the mission and experience you guys provide to every student. I come to find out that 75% of students at UCA wouldn't be able to attend without financial help. We just want to take this time to encourage you, if it is in your heart, and it's also something you're passionate about, to give so that GCA can keep providing experiences to every student that comes through these doors. And today, our call for giving is for the Worthy Student Fund, which will help many students to have the same experiences we did here at GCA. We can all agree that these experiences are invaluable, and with your help, we can ensure that more students can feel the love and support that we all felt here on this campus. GCA staff, thank you so, so much for always going above and beyond and for sacrificing your time and energy to be the family, the second family we needed. We come back because of GC, what GCA stands for, and we give because we see the difference that it has made in our lives. The deacons will now come and uh, pass around their baskets for giving, but we also, there's a QR code that's gonna be left here on the, on the screen. But again, GCA, thank you so much for the experience you guys provided for us, so thank you. Dear God, thank you so much for all of your blessings. Thank you that we all get to come back here and remind ourselves of the wonderful experience we had at GCA. God, please help and bless all the staff and the students that are here every single day. Thank you for all of your blessings. In Jesus' name, amen.
2022 from Georgia Cumberland Academy. You've been enjoying looking at these pictures on the screens in the last couple minutes. Fifty years ago, Corral and whatever other predecessors it had became Camerata. Camerata has been on this campus by name for 50 years. And throughout those, many of those years, we also had a separate, sometimes larger group called Corral. And uh, many of you may very well have been part of either Camerata or Corral in the past. And this is your wonderful opportunity to step back in time and once again be part of Camerata. So if you were ever part of Camerata or Corral, please come forward and join Camerata on the stage right now ever part of Corral or Camerata. Now, if you were in Corral, maybe you couldn't sing at all, and you lip-synced your way through that year just to get the music credit. You couldn't sing 30 years ago, you can't sing now, but don't let that stop you. Come on up. Maybe you can't sight-read the music, doesn't matter. Just lip sync, but Camerata or Corral, well, we've got a good group coming up. So if you're ever part Camerata or Corral or its predecessor, come on up as we celebrate 50 years of Camerata. We're waiting. Aeolians. It was called the Aeolians. Okay, I've been instructed that the predecessor to Camerata were Aeolians. Extra credit if you know what Aeolian means. Okay, last call. Okay, there. Yep, come around to the front. If you come to class late, you sit on the front row. Let's go. That's the way it works. All right, Mr. Torsney, make this group sound good.
We want to thank the current faculty and staff and the students uh, for welcoming us and hosting us this week. And wasn't the music beautiful this morning? Can we give them a round of applause one more time? Thanks, man. It's wonderful to be back here on campus, a campus that for me, graduating in 2004, has changed a lot, but changed for the better. And it's always wonderful to come back and see familiar faces, but to also see that things are continuing to move forward. You hope that for the next generation. And so it's such a joy to be here, a place where we get to share memories together, a place where we get to reminisce on our our time here and what it meant to us. You know, so it's so fun already to be able to hear some of the different stories that, that have come up about what each of us remember about our time here at GCA. You know, certainly we learned a lot both in and out of the classroom. It was a meaningful experience to each of us. And my prayer this morning is, as we spend some time here in God's Word, that we can have that vision that, the, that this group just sang about this sole vision and purpose for God rekindled in our hearts. With that said, would you bow your heads with me as we invite God's presence to be here with us. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we love you. And Lord, we thank you so much for the opportunity to be here in this place. God, we thank you for the people here. We want to ask, Lord, that you would be with us now that you would give us that vision for you and for only you. We ask this in your name. Amen. So I've had a lot of fun realizing that for for me, graduating in 2004, this is my my 20th reunion being here at GCA. And for those of you who are alumni, perhaps you too have enjoyed thinking about the memories you have here. Good memories, maybe, maybe not so good memories. There's usually a mix of it. But it's, it's sometimes interesting what memories actually come and surface. I, I was remembering one of the times that, that sticks out to me was a test I had to take here. I was a sophomore, and it was our midterm biology exam. Now, as a sophomore, for anyone who knew me, Um, I wasn't wowing anyone with my scholastic prowess. And so as the midterm exam came, I wasn't ready for it, and I started to prepare for the midterm exam like I did for almost all exam, which meant a full night of cramming, trying to learn a semester's worth of material in about six to eight hours. And so that's what I did. With the biology test coming up, I crammed all night. And I remember as the the sun came up in the morning, I was grateful for it so that I could stop studying because that was plenty of biology for me for one semester. But as I walked out of the boys' dorm towards the science building, I had an uneasy feeling that I was not ready for the exam, obviously. And I realized that any success that I had at this test was going to be a lot more about luck than about what I had learned. And it turns out that luck was about to show up in the conversation that I had with one of my friends. As I was walking into the classroom, one of my friends who had been in the previous section walked out, and he simply kind of said this cryptic one-liner. He said, be sure to read all the questions. And that did not seem like too helpful of advice, but let's be honest, I wasn't in a position to, to discard any advice at this point. So as I sat down at the desk... And as the exams were passed out, I began to to look over the the questions on the first page, and and that that feeling of despair started to come to me as I realized, yeah, I don't, with confidence, I'm not sure that I could say that I know any of the answers to these questions. And it's then that I remembered, once again, what what my friend had said, to, to read all the instructions. So I thought, okay, I'll give that a shot. And so I, I read the instructions on the first page which said something along the lines of this. It said, write your name on the top of the exam and then read through all of the questions without answering any of them. 
Now, if there was one thing I was prepared to do that day, it was to not answer any of the questions. So I was ready for that part of the exam and also writing my name. I totally had that part down. I could do that. I was a sophomore. I knew my name. I could even write it without using a crayon. So I wrote my name, Nate Dubs, and then I started reading through the questions. And at first, it kind of felt like a twisted exercise for the teacher to have us do because it just confirmed for me, yeah, I sure don't know a lot of the answers. I knew a few of them, and there was a slight temptation to maybe start filling in a couple of the answers that I did know. But as I turned the pages, for the most part, it was page after page of questions that I didn't know the answer to. But I finally made it to the last page and the last question on the exam. And as I turned there... I found hope. I found hope in the form of the very last question of the very last page. Because it said something like this. If you have followed the instructions by writing your name on the exam and by not writing or filling in any of the other questions, then you can flip this page over, draw a picture of Santa and his reindeer, and turn the exam in for full credit. This was a good day. Now, now I'm not going to lie. I didn't learn a lot about biology here at GCA. (laughs) But, through no fault of GCA, but I did learn a lot about a big God who works miracles of grace. Amen? Which came in handy because I turned out to be a pastor instead of a biologist. So it really worked out okay in the end anyways. That's the, that's the type of custom educational experience you can get here at GCA. Some of you probably left here understanding the kingdom, class, phylum of a jaguar, all of that. I left knowing how to draw a really good holiday card. And so I did that. I mean, I don't want to brag, but I drew an amazing picture of Santa and his reindeer. I even shaded some of it. And I remember smugly walking to the front of the room, turning in my exam, and passing the class. Now, I don't share that story uh, for current students. I don't recommend that, that type of action. That did not work the same way for me when it came to Algebra 1. But I tell that story to illustrate an important point. Sometimes... The questions that we choose to answer can change everything. Uh, We can choose to answer any number of questions in our lives, but sometimes knowing the right questions to answer, it can change everything. I think of my time here at GCA and, and knowing how to ask somebody to a banquet. That was an important question to know the answer to, but an even more important question was knowing who to ask to a banquet. Knowing how to make friends was an important question to ask, but knowing how to be a good friend was an even more important question to ask and to answer. And I'm sure that if we had the time, we could go around the room today, and you've seen in your own lives, in your own careers, This principle in action, that knowing the right question to ask, it matters. From our careers, to our relationships, to our purposes, to our passions, it impacts everything. And it also impacts our spiritual lives. So this morning, with with the little bit of time that we have here, I want us to take some time to focus and to explore what the most important question is to ask and to answer when it comes to our spiritual lives. It's an important question to ask, and it can be hard to know where to turn because life sends so many questions our way. But thankfully, the Bible gives us a clue on how to find out what the most important question is to ask and answer. And we can find it today if we look at the story of a blind man. If you have your your Bibles with you, I invite you to turn your Bibles to our passage this morning. It's found in John chapter 9. John chapter 9. I'll be reading through the New King James Version. I believe the texts are going to be on the screen this morning. And we're going to dive into this story. John chapter 9, in verse 1 it says this. Now, as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, 
Who sinned? This man or his parents, that he was born blind. Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. I love what Jesus is saying here. Jesus is is not claiming that this man was born so that the power of God could be displayed in him. Simply saying that something like God is the one who caused his blindness so that now God could restore his sight and be the cure. Instead, what Jesus is sharing is something that's so important for each of us to understand. And that's that God's greatest glory comes from bringing the greatest good into our lives. Whether this man had been born blind or had been born with full functioning sight, no matter how we come into this world, God's desire for each of us is to bring the greatest good into our lives. And God was about to bring that good into this man's life. You can continue to follow along with me in verses 6 and 7 when it says, When he had said these things, he spat on the ground and made clay with the saliva. And he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. And he said to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated sent. So he went and washed, and he came back seeing. It was an incredible miracle. Just a few moments with Jesus changed everything for this man. He came back seeing an incredible transformation. In fact, the transformation he went through was so incredible, almost so unbelievable that his community had a hard time understanding it. We read about this in verses 8 and 9. It says, Therefore the neighbors and those who previously had seen that he was blind said, Is not this he who had sat and begged? Some said, This is he. Others said, He's like him. But he said, No, I am he. They didn't have a context for this. Understanding how such an amazing transformation could take place. So with the lack of understanding came the questions. Throughout the rest of this chapter, throughout the rest of the story, if there's one thing, one theme that comes up in what we're about to see, it's the volume of questions that are asked. So this morning as we work through the rest of this story... We want to do so through the eyes of trying to look specifically at what questions they're asking. We're looking for what the most important question is that we should be asking in our own lives. And we'll find it as we look at the questions that they asked. So to do this, we're going to be looking through the lens of the five W's and an H. Many of you guys remember this from your English class. The five W's are who, what, when, where, why, and the H is... How? You guys know this. We're going to go look through these interrogatives. And so as we look at these texts, I'll ask you to say out loud the specific interrogative that you see in these texts. We're going to explore this as this community in disbelief started peppering him with questions. We find their first question moving forward in verse 10. And it says, Therefore they said to him, what is it? How? How were your eyes opened? How could this be? He simply responded in verse 11. He answered and said, A man called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes. And he said to me, Go to the pool of Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and I received my sight. That led to another question. We see it in verse 12. It says, Then they said to him, What does it say? Where? Where is he? His response was simple and humble. I don't know. They weren't getting the answers that made sense to them. So eventually news of this reached the religious leaders and he was brought before the Pharisees. We pick up the story in verses 13 through 15. It says, They brought him who was formerly blind to the Pharisees. Now it was a Sabbath when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. Then the Pharisees also asked him again how he had received his sight. And he said to them, He put clay on my eyes and I washed and I see." Now, in this, in this text that we just read, it does say that they asked him the question, how do you now see? But as we read verse 16, we can begin to realize that the question that was most on their minds wasn't just the how, but it was when. Because verse 16 says, therefore, some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God because he does not keep the Sabbath. 
It wasn't just the how that they were concerned with. It was the when. Because as you know, this community took the Sabbath very, very seriously. They wanted to protect the Sabbath as a special sacred time. So they had dozens upon dozens of rules and regulations as to what could and couldn't happen on those Sabbath hours. They had rules about nearly everything. In fact, as I was reading um, earlier this week, they even had a rule that forbade people to spit on people's eyes and anoint their eyes with their saliva. Which I don't know if any of you have been part of a policy-making committee, but that is policy-making at its worst. For people to come up with a rule as, as ridiculous as that, that you can't spit on somebody on Sabbath, as if that would be okay to do the rest of the days of the week. But these people had rules for everything. And so the question wasn't just how it was done, but the problem was when it was done. Because in their minds, how could a miracle possibly happen if it was breaking their Sabbath commands? So they continued to have questions for him. And these questions continued in verse 17. It says, they said to the blind man again, what does it say? What? What do you say about him because he opened your eyes? And the man said, he's a prophet. Now they had such a hard time trying to have a context for what was happening here. They couldn't believe this man in his own words, so they actually called the man's parents in. And they began asking the man's parents many of the same questions. Because of time, we're going to skip those verses and simply jump back to when they, the man starts responding after they visit his parents in verse 24. And so again, they called the man who was blind and said to him, give God the glory. We know that this man is a sinner. Can you guys see what's happening here? They have questions about what has just happened. And because they don't have a context for the answers that they're receiving, they're not able to focus on what's really important. And this man is starting to understand that. This man that was born blind, and he answered and he said in verse 25, whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I know, that though I was born blind, now I see. They were frustrated. In verse 26, they continued and it says, two questions we'll find in this one. They said to him again, what does it say? What did he do to you? The second one, how did he open your eyes? You can sense that this man is becoming more and more frustrated, that he's beginning to realize that though he has been blind his whole life, that these people asking the questions don't have better vision than he does. And so he responds back to them. In verse 27, he answered and he turns a question on them. He says, I told you already and you did not listen. What does it say? Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become one of his disciples? He's taking a jab at them. He's realizing that they don't have good vision, that they're blind to what's most important in life, and he's getting more and more bold as he addresses them. And they respond in verse 28, getting upset. It says, they reviled him. And they said, you are his disciple, but we are Moses' disciples. We know that God spoke to Moses. As for this fellow, we do not know, what does it say? Where he came from. As if understanding where Jesus came from mattered. This man calls them on how blind they are to what's most important in the next verse, in verse 30. And he says this, The man answered and said to them, Why, this is a marvelous thing, that you don't know where he's from? Yet he's opened my eyes. You can just hear the frustration coming off of these these words here in Scripture. Of how blind they were. Of how they were letting not knowing where Jesus came from be something that would prevent them from celebrating the fact that this man who had been blind his whole life could now see. He finished in verse 33 by saying, If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. But they couldn't grasp it. 
These religious leaders were so blinded by the questions swirling around in their minds that they couldn't understand how to prioritize what was most important. They chose to prioritize how he had done it, where Jesus was from, why he did it, when he did it, and their focus on finding answers to those questions blinded them from the most important question. So with these questions unanswered, verse 34 says, they answered and said to him, you were completely born in your sins. And are you teaching us? And they cast him out. They put him away. And even though that was meant to be some type of a form of punishment, the reality is, is that being removed from the temple and from their presence meant that he was ultimately able to also be removed from the questions they were asking so that he could answer the question that really mattered. Because sometimes in life, the answer we most need is the answer we can't see. And the reason that we can't see it is sometimes because no one's asking the right question. For these people... They weren't asking the right question, and they blinded them to the question that they needed to be asking the most. But this man, this man who had been born blind was learning to see. And he found the most important question as Jesus came to meet with him in verse 35. Jesus heard that they had cast him out. And when he had found him, he said to him, Do you believe In the Son of God. Do you believe in the Son of God? That is an important question. In fact, if we were to turn over to John chapter 20, as John writes a summary of of his entire gospel about the life of Jesus, it's as though John at the end of chapter 20 wants to whisper to our ears saying, this is what's most important. It says in John chapter 20, verse 30 and 31, and truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written, why does it say? That you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. And so when Jesus came to this man who had been cast out of the temple back in John 9, and when he said, do you believe in the Son of God? He was asking him the most important question. It wasn't what, it wasn't when, it wasn't where, it wasn't why, it wasn't how. But in verse 36, we see it. The man answered and he said, what does it say? Who? Who is he, Lord, that I may believe in him? The most important question that we need to answer is, Who is the Son of God, and do we believe in him? Jesus responded in verse 37. He said to them, you have both seen him, and it is he who is talking with you. This is the final question. The most important question that any of us could ever answer in our lives But sometimes we can forget to answer it. Because life has a way of blinding us from focusing on what's most important in life. We may look over when God does something. We can look through all the whys we think God does or doesn't do something. We can look down on what we see God doing or not doing. But faith is found when we look up. When we turn our eyes away from the questions that the world has for us and we look up at the most important answer, Jesus. When we look up and we turn our eyes on him. We're here, gathered today, at an alumni weekend because we have a shared experience. Some of us are separated by decades of of spending this time here at GCA, but we have this shared space that we've come to be at today. 
GCA, a Seventh-day Adventist Christian school. It's a faith tradition that's been good to me, and I pray it's been good for you. But it's a faith tradition that provides a lot of answers. Answers on what to eat or not to eat. Answers on how to worship, how to love, how to live, how to rest, when to rest. Answers on how to make a perfect haystack. The amount of answers that we have and that we've been told are numerous. And all these answers can be a good thing. I've been blessed by it and I appreciate it. But it's only a good thing as long as they don't blind us from the most important answer. In the midst of all of life's questions, in the midst of all of life's answers, look up beyond all other questions, beyond all other answers. Look up and turn your eyes upon Jesus, the answer we really need. We end this story in John chapter 9, verse 38. This man, though he couldn't, he hadn't seen his whole life, had perfect clarity at the question he needed to answer. And so in verse 38, he did it. It simply says, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. I don't know where you are today. I don't know what you've been through, why things did or didn't work out. I don't know who wants to be in your future, but I do know who wants to be with you now. Jesus, the Son of God, the one whose greatest glory comes from working the greatest good in your life. So when the questions of life begin blurring out joy, when all of the answers begin to blur out hope, I want to encourage you to look up, turn your eyes upon Jesus. When you don't know what to do, look up, turn your eyes upon Jesus. When you get that diagnosis, look up, turn your eyes upon Jesus. When your relationship is struggling, look up, turn your eyes upon Jesus. When your loved one is suffering, look up, turn your eyes upon Jesus. When you wonder what the future holds, why something is happening, how you're supposed to move forward, focus on the who. Look up. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. The one who says, I know that you're going to have questions. I know that you're not always going to have all of the answers. But please answer this one question. Will you believe in me? Because I've given everything for you. I'm moving heaven and earth to try to reach you, to try to help you, to try to bring you a future and a hope, to try to bring good into your life. The question remains, how will you answer this question? GCA, I encourage you and I challenge you, no matter what questions life throws at you, Focus on the one that matters so much. Look up. Turn your eyes upon Jesus.
Sing with us. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for being our who, for being who we go to for all our answers, for being our ultimate healer. Lord, we pray that our eyes will be opened, that they'll be open to what we need and what we can see the need in others and point them to you and point them to look up. So, Lord, I just pray um, on behalf of everyone in this, in this congregation now that we would look up. Lord, give us the encouragement to do that and the peace and the will to do that. And thank you for being our loving Heavenly Father. In your name, amen. Um, you are dismissed, but we just want to remind you, if you are an honor class or a former staff, if you'll please come up front for photos.
Why do you 